All right, so we have Mr. Brandon Cornett here today with us from Elevator 3. I want to welcome everyone to our third and final talk of the semester in our Distinguished Lecturer Series, part of our Industry Connect initiative. Um, and so just having to give you a little bit of background information on Brandon. He is the CEO and the co-founder of Elevator 3, which is a software consulting agency in Baton Rouge. Elevator 3 provides custom web and mobile development apps apps, um, business intelligence, and system integration services for clients ranging from startups to government entities. Brandon is also the CTO at Paystar, which is a software product that strives to simplify bill payment processes for utility companies. And for both businesses, Brandon desires to build teams that love to do what they do and that have the tools that they need to deliver scalable and robust products for their clients. Brandon graduated with a bachelor's in computer science from Southeastern, so he's one of our alums, um, back in 2012, and he sits on the department's industry advisory board. He helps pro um, provide feedback and advice on improving the curriculum and better preparing our students for professional settings, and he serves as clients in some of our industry connect classes, as you know, 411 um, specifically this semester. He received his uh, MBA from LSU, and he also enjoys presenting technical and professional topics at things like the SQL Saturday and other local user groups. So today he's joining us. It's a privilege to have him um, come in and, and speak to us on mobile development for business. And he's just gonna tell us about some of the lessons he's learned. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to Mr. Cornett. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Bonnie. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, and I'll go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. Just wanna make sure you guys can hear me all right, correct? Can y'all hear me? Yes. yes we can okay, hear you. great. And you should be seeing the screen now. Just let me know when you can see that. Looks good. Great. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I kind of wanted to just give a little bit of background, which uh, Bonnie already did really for me. So um, yeah, just wanted to mention, uh, I've been in, in most of the computer science uh, student shoes that, that are watching right now. So uh, I know how everything everything goes, uh, trying to make it through school and get out into the real world. So the main point of this topic was really to try to provide uh, some context into, you know, things I've just learned over 11 years of being in the actual, the, you know, the workforce and try to give you some some tips and, and things to watch out for, essentially. Um, she mentioned Elevator 3 and Paystar, so I don't need to really go over that. Uh, one of the bigger things I wanted to say is just I've been in the development role, both, you know, an intern, junior developer, senior developer, uh, but I've also been on the other side on uh, the PM front. So um, in one of my positions at Turner Industries, I started kind of doing more of the project management. And I think there's a great um, being a developer and then moving to a PM position kind of gives you a great, um, <clears throat> great insight into kind of what developers are thinking. Right. So and the ability to have um, just the ability to connect the two pieces is what I'm really interested in. How do you connect the developers to the, the business side of things and kind of communi communicate those requirements back and forth? So I uh, like doing that, but I've kind of been around the block in terms of all the different roles available. So uh, just wanted to mention that. And then also um, everything from, I kind of started in the consulting world. So uh, I, I actually was at Invoke. Uh, for about six years. So I know you guys are in the Invoke Innovation Lab right now. So uh, great experience there. Um, moved over to more of an enterprise setting uh, at Turner Industries. So kind of went from a smaller company, right, that's working with clients directly. And you're kind of the person that's that's really driving the, the revenue for the company, right, to something more of an enterprise like Turner that um, you're not the the person driving the revenue, you're actually more of a, you're seen as more of an overhead, right? Because you're you're not the main primary function of the business. So that was an interesting switch um, uh, to get into the enterprise realm. And then now I'm back in the startup realm with Paystar and Elevator 3. So uh, kind of made it full circle, but uh, kind of in that realm, I just wanted to let you guys know that it's great to 
uh, kind of get the different perspectives. So um, being able to see how you do consulting and how enterprises work and bureaucracy and, and who you're kind of reporting to uh, on each of those different fronts. So uh, definitely interesting there. So uh, also got my MBA from LSU. That was the only other thing. So. Uh, I guess the other thing I wanted to say is that I kind of started putting thoughts together for this talk and ended up with a diagram that looks like this that you can barely see. So um, <laughs> 11 years is a long time and you learn a lot. So I was trying to figure out what to say in this talk. So if some of it comes across not as coherent as I'd like, uh, you can kind of see why. <laughs> so I'll try to keep it to about, you know, 30, 45 minutes. So the main point of this talk was um, letting you know that businesses are going mobile, right? I'm working with more and more clients that I'm seeing are doing mobile and kind of just wanted to dig into why that may be. Why are they going mobile? Uh, and then I kind of asked myself this next question, why does a business do anything? And the answer to that is they're trying to increase profits, right? For the, for the large majority of cases, that's the main point of the business. The business is to increase profits. So how do you go about doing that? Uh, we can either, well, really, we need to maintain our current revenue, right? Uh, we then need to add more revenue uh, to increase our profits. But you can also do this by decreasing costs as well. So um, different ways to go about that. Um, but we're going to kind of dig into how we, how mobile apps can help accomplish these tasks. So one of the ways um, that we can help increase profits is to improve the decision-making ability of the company. Um, we can do this by, or let's see. So if we allow our managers and executives to make decisions faster, we can start making decisions that, that allow us to make the, the ones that will make us most profitable, right? And the way mobile fits into that is we can start collecting data from anywhere, right? If I have, uh, Turner, for example, right? If I have um, 20,000 people out in the field uh, working in all these plants across the U.S. or across, you know, the Gulf South, um, allowing them to have these iPads or, or phones in their hands um, lets them collect data kind of on the fly from anywhere they're at. Um, now that we can collect the data, um, we can immediately provide that information back to the home office, which we can then turn into dashboards um, and stuff like that, which can be presented to executives and they can just see that information on their computer, you know, sitting in their office. So uh, it kind of gives a lot more visibility. It also gives you more accurate data, right? Because now we're not taking, you know, paper, writing down information on it, kind of sending it off in the mail or something like that. Um, if we have these mobile devices that are internet connected, we can now quickly enter that data. It's more accurate. It gets submitted on the fly and we provide more visibility to those people who need to make those decisions. Um, from a company that's providing, you know, uh, mobile apps or, or technology to, um, I guess one way to go about this is to also make yourself more sticky, right? So if you're, if you already have existing clients that you, you're scared you may lose, or, you know, you want to just embed yourself more so that you don't uh, lose that client, this kind of goes to the maintaining revenue, right? The way you can do that is um, figuring out, okay, we have our current processes, we have what we currently implemented with the, the client, but how can we find ways to add more uh, value to that client as well? And you can do that by cross-selling, you know, different mobile apps and, and different technologies that um, provide more insight into uh, the business and how to make it more efficient. Uh, let's see. You can also improve your sales pipeline, right? So it's about new sales as well. How do we get new revenue? And that's also from um, creating apps or giving information to your sales representatives that let them um, make decisions quicker, get notified that they need to reach back out to these different sales prospects. Um, so, so really uh, creating tools that will help your sales team uh, contact these clients as necessary, figure out who they need to be contacting, when they need to do it. And then you can also automate that process, right? You can also... Uh, not only see I need to contact these people, but quickly have templates or something that can be in the palm of people's hands at any given moment where they can just say, hey, let's let's send an email out or a text message or something and start a conversation. So having these little flexible devices in the palms of these any of these um, employees' hands kind of makes this whole process more efficient. Um, 
kind of on that note, it's interesting too, because I've seen it at some of the larger companies I've worked at, um, they also use <laughs> mobile technology as more of a marketing tool too, right? So it's not only, um, it's not only how can we actually improve these processes and actually do it, but also if we're saying we have all this innovation and, and you know, all these different things that are providing these awesome benefits, um, that's great marketing material too. So um, that can actually be the difference if you're bidding on a contract, for instance, um, that technology may actually push you over the edge, right? And I've seen that more than once. So uh, it can also be a, a good marketing tool. So I kind of wanted to step into some of the examples I've seen um, that have, you know, I've either created or I've seen just implemented in businesses. Um, so some of those that are trying to increase the profit, right, are automation. So how do we automate manual processes that are happening at the moment? Um, whether that be on paper, whether that be, you know, maybe it's uh, calculations that are happening uh, by hand right now. How can we put that, put a process in place where now people can just simply input, you know, quick numbers or inputs and then have that process actually happen behind the scenes uh, without manual intervention. So if you can do that, that kind of goes to the cost cutting aspect of it, right? Um, so if we're reducing our costs, now we're being more efficient. We can use our people in other ways. Uh, that then drives up the profit in the long run. Uh, asset tracking is another one. So this is all about inventory or, you know, uh, different items out in the field, potentially. Um, a lot of the, you'll notice a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about is, or a lot of my examples are, are more industrial. That comes from the Turner perspective, right? Um, so kind of in, in that whole realm, uh, a, a big thing was, we have a lot of parts, we have a lot of equipment that we're moving around to different places, and sometimes that equipment just gets lost, or sometimes we put it somewhere and we don't remember where we put it. So um, there's lots of, of mobile app capabilities in that realm to, to kind of remember locations that you put things, or maybe it's the last one I have on the list is process tracking, right? So we can actually scan barcodes, kind of put QR codes in different things, or barcodes where we can scan things. And you can use that mobile device's location uh, that's built in kind of keep track of different, you know, different pieces of equipment. Uh, we talked about sales a little bit, right? The ability to give these, these tools to our sales team that give them quick access to information kind of goes along with the CRM too, customer relationship management. Being able to take notes on, on our customers, what they like, what they don't like, um, and kind of, kind of giving that information very quickly to our sales team on mobile devices where they can quickly just look it up. Um, those are great tools that help speed up the sales pipeline as well. Uh, handbooks and reference materials are another one, being able to just type in, you know, what I'm looking for and be able to see a whole process listed out on a device. Uh, that's another really good uh, cost-cutting um, application that we can develop. Uh, customer collaboration is another one, just, again, <laughs> this being more geared towards plants uh, in, my, in my experience, but... Uh, being able to quickly do things on tablets in the field as they're happening and then giving that information to our customers as well or their customers that can, so they can kind of know what's going on in real time, right? So now they can sit in the control room and monitor everything across their plant or what we're doing. Um, so all of these things contribute to, to kind of increasing our profits um, and kind of mixing that with how cheap devices are getting. Um, and it kind of depends on what you're looking for, but if you kind of mix that in, uh, mobile apps can be a great tool to just provide value to a business um, and kind of, you know, increase our profits overall. So there's also some scenarios where mobile may not make sense uh, to certain businesses. Uh, you'd be surprised, you know, I said costs are lower, uh, but if you're trying to deploy, you know, a thousand or two thousand or however many tablets across a whole organization, um, those costs do add up. So. Uh, one of the big things you have to consider when you're thinking about mobile is um, the hardware cost um, and kind of how that plays into it. Who's going to pay for it? Um, you know, if you're doing this for one of your clients or one of the customer's clients, uh, maybe there's a potential to kind of share that cost between the two. Um, but that's definitely something to consider. And then also just the development costs. Um, that one's kind of interesting coming from a consulting background. Uh, sometimes you get clients that come in and you give them a quote for how much an app's going to cost and they just, their eyes just get super wide, right? They're like, I, I had no idea this was going to cost this much. Um, 
And then other times you actually have people that come in thinking it's going to be a lot more. So uh, it's a very interesting dynamic in, in consulting that you have to just consider. Uh, let's see. Another thing that you need to think about when you're thinking about making a mobile app is, does it even need to be a mobile app, right? Um, mobile inherently just comes with a bunch of different considerations you have to think about. Um, one of the questions you need to make sure you ask yourself, am I doing this because it's cool or am I trying to push it because it's cool or because I want to do it? Or could it just be a simple, you know, responsive mobile website um, that that you can kind of develop on the fly, push out? It's not distributed at all. You don't have to worry about any of the infrastructure or not as much of the infrastructure. Um, so does it actually need to be a mobile app or is a website that's just responsive something that the client would, would be okay with? <clears throat> Uh, also, asking yourself why someone would download it. Um, if you're, I think this one is kind of different in different scenarios. If you're a business and you have employees that are, you know, that will have these devices, obviously you can push this app to them and say, hey, you're using this app as part of the process, right? Um, but if you're doing it something, you know, if you're making something that you're just trying to push to the app store, you do have to consider you just need to think about why would someone do this? What's their incentive to go and download it? Um, and it's definitely interesting in, again, the consulting realm, when clients come in, this is one of the questions we ask them is, you know, have you thought about why you want it to be a mobile app? Because it could, again, just be a website. Um, what's someone, who's going to actually log into the app store and say, okay, I want to search for, you know, a t-shirt app and, or a t-shirt making app. Why wouldn't they just go to the website or Google it or something like that? Um, so just considering that, uh, if you have competition, you know, you have to provide something unique. That's just part of business as well, right? If you don't have something that sets you apart, um, you're not really going to make it um, without having that differentiation if somebody else is more popular. And then also, again, just kind of considering off-the-shelf products. Um, coming from the consulting world, again, if the client comes in and says, hey, I want this, I feel that it's partly my responsibility to say, hey, I know what you're asking for. I, I see that, but I also know this off-the-shelf product. Um, that that could solve your needs right away without us having to develop this for you. So why don't you just pay for that and use it? Some scenarios that works, some that doesn't, but it's always good to offer or think about what's what's off the shelf already that we can kind of put together or integrate with um, to reduce those costs. And it's interesting uh, because just off the top, you'd think from a consulting perspective, yeah, we want to make money. We want to build apps for people, right? But I've, I've found over the years that if you just give the client that's coming to you this off-the-shelf product project and, or product and you're honest with them, they actually, you, you know, you start to build trust there and they start to trust you more. So anytime they have any needs, you're kind of the first person that comes to mind because they'll trust that you're going to do what's in the best interest for them. So you may not get that project right now, you know, kind of starting off, but uh, maybe you'll get, you know, I've built many relationships that are still ongoing from, from way, you know, way back in the past. Um, and they just keep coming back and, and any question they have, I'm kind of the go-to person, right? So you're building that relationship for the long term, which gives you not only that, you know, that revenue right at the moment, but uh, also in the future as well. So, but if you have decided to build an app, um, this is kind of where I'm going to get more into sort of the tips and development um, development pieces of the presentation. So we've decided that we're going to make a mobile app now. Um, so what kind of considerations do we need? What should I watch out for? That kind of thing. So what are you building for? Um, this is one of the bigger things if you decided you're building a mobile app that you need to take into consideration. So is it iOS and Android? Is it phones and tablets or tablets? Is it landscape and portrait? Uh, these all may seem like in simple questions, but these are really you know, the bigger questions you have to get answered when you start to decide to build a mobile app. Um, and I think what we found is most of the time you can kind of start off with one platform or the other with clients and, um, you know, start somewhere, get something out there, and then kind of add the other platforms at a later date. And there are multiple ways to go about that, which I'll go into in just a second. But uh, there's lots of questions you need to start asking because if you're trying to support multiple platforms, multiple device sizes, you know, um, also, orientations, now you have to resize things, right? So it's just, it's a lot to consider. And that's one of the bigger questions you need to ask. Uh, I kind of like to call that device hell as well. Um, and 
that kind of goes into, you know, you have all these questions we're asking, but if you're pushing something out there to the store, you don't really know what someone's going to have, right? For If it's the app store, obviously they have an iOS device, right? If it's the Google Play store, um, there's, there's just tons and tons of options out there. So uh, you just really have to consider when you're building a mobile app, you know, you have people with any, any type screen size, uh, different capabilities, different versions. Some people may still have an iPhone 4, right, that you have to support. So, um, and you can set all that, and those are decisions you have to make. But it's just you have to put a lot of thought into what you're going to support uh, kind of up front, and that will kind of determine what you're going to do down the road. Uh, and then I kind of just have on here text selection, too. So, again, are you doing something more web-based? Um, you know, you can use React Native. I know that is native, but you can write it in JavaScript. Are you doing cross-platform technologies where it's not, you know, Swift or, or Java or whatever it may be? Uh, we're doing something more cross-platform that somebody's built on top of those, right? Um, all of those are different tools that you have in your tool belt. Um, and you, they just have different considerations for both. If you write something natively that's not cross-platform, uh, such as, again, Swift or something like that, now to do an Android version of the application, we have to almost, you know, it's almost a complete rewrite. Uh, we might know all the logic and how it's going to work, but now we have to rewrite it on a different platform versus something like um, Xamarin or even before that, a long time ago, we had Accelerator um, from Titanium. That was what I started on. Um, but those are all cross-platform tools that let you build for all those different devices at the same time. Um, so Lots of pros and cons to both. I think Xamarin Forms is something that was just starting to catch on kind of towards the end of when I was developing. Um, I know there was a lot of limitations up front, so you kind of just have to, to play it by ear and figure out what your requirements are, what you're going to support, and then you can kind of go and select the tech from there. All right, uh, another thing I wanted to mention, just because there are so many different devices, um, there's services out there which are pretty cool to uh, to use. Um, they are actually libraries of real devices that you can kind of pick and choose what you want to test on, but you can push your app up to this, this service. This one here is App Center. They have, it's called App Center Test, I believe. Um, I think this used to be Xamarin Cloud when I used to use it. Um, but essentially you push your app up and it will step through every one of your screens or whatever you've set up for tests. And it will actually tell you, hey, these all work on these different devices. Here's the screenshots I have for each step of your test. Um, but, you know, on this specific one right here, this one crashed or, you know, had an exception. So it'll tell you that, show you the error message that popped up and a screenshot of exactly when it happened as well. So uh, there's a lot of tools out there that will help you um, develop for, for multiple platforms all at once and sizes and, and all that kind of stuff. So another thing you need to consider is how you're going to approach the project. So now we've we've determined what we're building for, what platforms we're going to use, um, but you also kind of have to talk about the approach to the project, I guess. Um, right up front, you need to determine what your minimum viable product is, and I'm not sure how much um, you know this gets talked about, but choosing, I, I guess, one approach is, hey, let's let's plan for, for multiple months, figure out exactly what we're going to do, right? This is more of a waterfall approach, but figure out exactly what we're going to do and then try to go build it all at once. And it's going to take months and months and months. We finally release it to the public or to our users and it just doesn't work. It's not what they expect. And that's kind of the problem with waterfall in general. Um, so taking more of an agile approach and saying, okay, what can we do that's the minimum amount of work that will be able, you know, will still provide value to our end user but let's go ahead and get it out there, have them start testing it, uh, and then provide feedback to us that lets us kind of pivot on the fly and, and go down different routes as we need to and keep adding on to this, you know, this base product. Um, I find that works really well. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of a company called Block Lawn Care um, in Baton Rouge, but they're a, I guess, on-demand lawn service. It's a mobile app you can download where you type in your address, gives you a quote for your house, uh, for lawn mowing, and then you kind of say go, and somebody will accept and come out and cut your grass. That's generally the whole process. Um, but what we did with them, they had this giant plan, they wanted all these features, and we said, you know what, let's start out with something small, and maybe what we started out with, you have to do some manual intervention with throughout the process, 
Um, and what we'd like to do is when we have, you know, thousands and thousands of users, we'd like this process to be all more automatic, but to get it out there, to test the waters, so you don't have to go spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, let's start with something that's a lot smaller and a lot cheaper, so you can get it out there. It looks really great, but you can prove your idea and then start building on top of it. Um, I, I've just found over time that that's a great way to go about it. Um, and it kind of lets you build that relationship with uh, that customer you're building your app for too. Um, and you kind of work together to, to build what's best. Another point is um, starting with the 90% case. So um, there's a lot of different things that can happen, a lot of different ways and, and weird things that, that can throw wrenches into your projects. So for just starting out, just making sure your, your, your account, if you can account for 90% of what's gonna happen or 95 even, and there's all these little edge cases at the end, don't worry about those edge cases that's up front. Try to get that MVP out there, try to get that base project out there that covers that, you know, the majority of the cases. And um, I've even found that what you can do is kind of log or watch with analytics what's going on in your app. And if somebody's trying to go outside of that 90% case you've built for, just have alerts that, that kind of go to you that say, hey, somebody's, somebody's doing something different than what we expected, which may cause an issue. Uh, but starting off, that's okay. And we know that we've developed this app, but you know, we're working on it. But um, for that 10%, you can kind of just work one-on-one -on -one with those people that need those specific things. Um, so take it one step at a time, um, start with something, then build on it and keep adding features over time and you'll have something great. Another thing I found is having deadlines for yourself. Even if it's, you know, if you have a client, you definitely have deadlines. But if you don't, and you're building something internally, try to set deadlines for yourself too of milestones you want to get to. Um, I find that that kind of gives you uh, something to shoot for. You start realizing if you're, you're being too ambitious, so you can kind of set your own, you know, when are we going to have this thing fully done? Uh, so, so just try to do that when you can. Just as a general rule too, if you haven't experienced this yet, 80% um, of a project is really easy to do. You can kind of knock it out. And, you know, if it's a six month project, we can knock out 80% in probably like three months in general. And we know that uh, it's that last three months is just completing that last bit of 20% of work because there's so much um, kind of complexities and different, oh, we forgot to add this or we didn't handle that, you know, those other 10% of edge cases. So um, in general, getting the bulk of your app done is, is fairly easy to do and straightforward, but really you have that 20% that takes a lot longer. Um, so just kind of prepare for that as well. Your clients are always gonna have, you know, things that you missed or reports they want or, or whatever that you have to kind of flush out that weren't in the original scope. And in short, ship it. This is something I see Justin Abdi on, on this call too. He's a partner at Elevator 3, but that's kind of our, you know, what we like to say a lot is, you know, we can sit here and think about it, we can talk about it, but let's try to ship something. Uh, fail fast if we need to, right? Failing's not, it, it's not a bad thing um, as long as it's not bad, right? But failing in general is not bad. Let's let's learn from it. Let's get better, uh, ship it out there and start getting feedback from the customer that, that lets us, um, you know, move forward and provide exactly what they're looking for. So moving on to a little bit more of the development side of things, uh, I'm just going to list out a couple of hard things that keeps you know, that keep coming up over time. Um, time zones are the first thing that I feel like I need to mention because they come up uh, all the time. Every, I feel like every week we talk about these. Um, time is hard. Uh, time zones are hard. There's daylight savings time you have to worry about. There's states like, I believe it's Arizona that don't observe daylight savings time. Um, there's also just different types of times in general. So, you know, if I have an event at 4 p.m., um, that I could keep going on this forever, but if I have an event at 4 p.m., I kind of just want it to be at 4 p.m. And I'm saying that no matter what versus trying to convert it to different time zones in certain scenarios. So just letting you know, uh, not going to go into it anymore, but time zones are one of the hardest things that I've come across. Um, there's different scenarios where you want kind of point in time times. You want to convert them to certain people's uh, time zones. If you fly to, you know, across the U.S., sometimes you want to see things in central time. You know, if I go to California, sometimes I want to see things in central time, even when I'm in California. Sometimes I want them to convert to my time zone wherever I'm at. Um, uh, it, it just kind of depends. So just just be aware of that. Uh, there are tools out there like Nota Time for C Sharp and Moment.js. And Moment has a time zone library as well. 
So just kind of keep that in mind uh, when you're doing things as well. I, I guess one note on that that I'd say is if you know that you're only in central time or if you're only in eastern time, something to consider in, in you know, and just shipping it, don't store everything in UTC and try to worry about time zones. Maybe if it's just for this one client and they're always gonna be in central time, let's just store things in central time, right? Keep it simple. So just a consideration. Uh, security is also hard and this kind of depends on uh, lots and lots of factors. Um, but in general, I think we found there's something for c -sharp specifically, there's something called identity server uh, that we've kind of adopted. It's a it's an open source platform. I think they're actually going paid, but um, people have put a lot of thought into security. They've, they've gone through, you know, different trials and everything. You trying to create your own security <laughs> framework is probably not gonna work out or wouldn't work out if somebody attacked it. Um, even using the built-in Microsoft, you know, authentication stuff, if you're doing C-sharp, that's great. Um, but try not to develop your own security mechanisms if you can. Um, one of the harder things on mobile is that, you know, on web, you're using cookies, you're using, um, if you're just doing logins on the web side of things, you're using cookies, you can use local storage and stuff like that. You don't really know what people are going to have, or you have to support all kinds of different things on mobile as well. Uh, there's refresh tokens and OAuth and all kinds of stuff. So I, I guess the bigger thing to say there, security is hard as well. Try not to recreate the wheel is a big takeaway there. Um, try to use something that somebody's put a lot of thought into already. Uh, another thing when you're doing mobile development is emulators versus real devices. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've developed a whole mobile app, thought it was great. And I was like, cool, let me plug it into the device to ship it to the customer, you know, or kind of put it on the device to test. I put it on the device and it just doesn't work. Um, <laughs> if you can, throughout the process of developing your, your application, try to test on the actual devices you're going to be using uh, because emulators won't match up all the time. Uh, you also, you know, if you're supporting cameras or location or whatever that may be, there just might be, you know, slight differences between the different, uh, the different platforms. So keep that in mind. Uh, I have to say that designs are hard too. Um, there's different types of programmers. There's, you know, people that are really good at, you know, user experience. But uh, kind of what I've, I've done is I've decided to stay in my lane. I've decided I'm a great developer. I cannot design anything. So... Uh, I kind of have contractors that I can reach out to to provide designs. Um, and then we kind of just implement those designs or, you know, hire one on staff if you can. Obviously, it's not um, not something everyone can do, uh, depending on the situation. But um, just designing things is, is hard in general. Uh, I find that mock-ups and wireframes are usually good to do. Um, they're low fidelity. They're They're very just straightforward and easy to look at. Um, but if you can kind of do those wireframes or mock-ups of what you're thinking, it kind of lets uh, you and the stakeholder, you and an actual designer doing the designs, you can kind of talk about those and relay those messages uh, back and forth to one another. Um, I guess this is a bigger one that, that I really try to harp on is app updates. So when you're distributing a mobile application, you're distributing it to the App Store. You're distributing it to the Play Store, right? People are downloading that. They could go turn their phone off and leave their phone in their drawer for, you know, uh, years and then come back and try to open up the app without updating it to the latest version. Um, and, and then you start to have problems potentially. So a big thing when you have a distributed application like, like you do with mobile apps is you need to be backwards compatible with, with different um, with all your different versions. You either need to decide to be backwards compatible or you need to have some way to communicate to your users, hey, this version of the app isn't gonna work anymore. You need to go download the new one. And I've kind of run into that a couple of times uh, over the years where I didn't build announcements, like the ability to communicate with my users into the application. And it's kind of bitten me. And one of the things is um, losing Android key stores. I think that a lot of the technologies help with this and Google may have fixed it by now or made it easier to keep track of, but um, there's actually something called a key store, like a certificate that you have to um, use when you're publishing Google Play applications. If you lose that key store, or you don't keep it around or you know backed up or anything, um, you can't publish updates to your application anymore. And I actually ran into it one time where I had a version up there, didn't have announcements or any way to communicate to users, lost the key store, had to push a new one, and I, I couldn't tell the people, hey, go download the other one from the app store. Or I, maybe I found a way, but it was really hacky and I made like, you know, 
an entity in the application or something. So kind of worked around it. But all that to say, I think announcements are really important to focus on. Make sure you have a way to communicate with your users, whether it's push notifications or something in the app, um, but also checking to see if you have maintenance going on, if your if your actual API or, or you know, web-based version or whatever it's communicating with goes down. Make sure you have a way to communicate that maintenance is going on. Um, and also, again, checking for version updates. If there's an update that's mandatory, checking that, uh, you know, doing that the first thing when someone loads the app could be really good to show them a warning and say, hey, you can't do this anymore. You need to go download the other one. Click here to open it or something. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. Uh, the next two kind of go together, data syncing and offline access. Um, that's always a really good question to ask um, when your customer wants an, an application. Is this going to be used? Again, kind of thinking through Turner's um, um, use case, they were in plants you know, throughout the Gulf South. And again, some of these plants don't have very good cell reception. So the ability to be able to work offline, how do you store that data locally, um, keep track of all the changes you're making, or maybe you can't keep track of them or, or change them, but you can just view data. You have to make all these decisions. Uh, and then how do we sync back up and have those two um, data sources kind of get combined in the end is kind of a hard thing to, to keep track of. So uh, definitely think about data syncing, offline access. There's a lot of great packages and tools out there, again, that other people have already thought about um, that can keep these in sync for you. Uh, scaling is another hard thing. So in general, if you're doing enterprise applications um, for smaller businesses, it may not be a problem, right? Um, you have this one API, you have this one app, it may do a bunch of work, things may be inefficient, but you know what, there's four users, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you're building something that's going to go out to 20,000 iPads or the general public, you need to be ready to scale. You need to be, your app needs to have the, or your API, I guess, is, is one thing. You need to be able to have that API scalable to where uh, you can handle the demand that comes in as well. Um, so just thinking about that, if you can, um, Azure, AWS, those online services make it very easy, sort of, to um, scale your applications as needed. There's lots of other things you have to think about, about data duplication and um, you know, cross server um, consistency and stuff like that. But just something to think about. And the last thing I think is really hard is naming your project. Um, you, I feel like you can spend forever on it. Um, what I've found is just, you know, name your project something. If you're making an online course system, name it courses. If you're, whatever it is, just name it what it is. And then coming back and renaming things is not hard. So uh, just, again, Focus on MVP. How can I get something out there that I can get feedback on, right? And then worry about the, the smaller things. So I'm gonna go through a few tips when you're developing. Uh, I'm sure this is pretty obvious, but commit often. Um, can't tell you how many times, not how many times I have or I've known someone that has reverted things inadvertently and lost everything or you know, didn't back things up. So or honestly, it comes to merging too. Uh, if you have all these different teams and people working on things, right? If you're not committing often and you don't have all these commits, you can kind of work through and make sure you can see what happened so you know how to merge things. Um, you just end up with these giant, you know, thousand file merges that you're trying to merge everything together. So just make sure you're committing often and you're merging into, you know, your, your, your common branch. I don't know if that's master or you guys have some other, maybe you have feature branches or whatever, but make sure you're trying to, to pull these different pieces together often, because if you don't, you're gonna end up at the end saying, okay, it may not even be worth it to try to merge this because we're so, you know, we have so many conflicts. Maybe we have to just try to rewrite it with, you know, the other person's changes. So make sure you commit. Kind of go along with that. Just please keep this in the back of your mind that you should always be taking backups. If you're moving things between servers or you're messing with the database at all that may cause an issue, really at all, if you're manually managing something, try to take backups. Um, again, that's just something that you see time and time again where someone didn't do it and you have to go try to figure out, you know, different alternative ways to get data back. It takes, generally doesn't take a lot to perform a backup or copy the folder that you're about to mess with. Uh, so please just try to do that. Um, these two kind of go together too. Um, didn't always do pull requests. Um, whenever you kind of, you know, go develop some code and you want to merge your code into the master branch and kind of push it in. On smaller teams, 
sometimes that person is just kind of pushing their stuff up and, you know, just going along and writing code and pushing it as they need to. When you have more than one person, you have multiple people working on a team, it's really good to <clears throat> create pull requests, which essentially say, you know, here's all the stuff that I changed. Here's the diff of everything I've done. Giving that to another uh, person on your team to kind of look at and look over um, is always a great idea because there's something you might have just missed. To go along with that, we started doing um, code demos. So when you do a pull request, also pulling a developer in, uh, just say, hey, come over to my computer, let me run this for you, show you what I did. I find that often a lot of times, you know, you're going over it, you're saying, hey, I'm, I, I did this, I did this, but you actually catch something in the requirements that you missed yourself um, just by demoing it to somebody. So even if they don't really get what you're doing, you going through it kind of gives you um, some perspective too. Uh, it may uncover some things that you missed. So, Another thing, uh, big, big O notation, time complexities, things that I learned in school that I didn't really pay too much attention to and kind of just gathered and took tests on and stuff like that, right? Uh, you don't really realize how important that is until you start trying to do what I was mentioning earlier with scaling. Um, I can't really, this is just something you have to figure out, you know, as you're writing queries, as you're working with databases, you just have to realize, you know, over time, what, what's fast, what's not. Uh, we're moving data, you know, over the network to pull loads of data down. <laughs> um, so it, it's just really important to, to kind of learn what's, what's efficient, what's not. If you're working with SQL Server, there's something called a SQL Server Profiler. That's not on my, I have a tools list coming up. I need to go add that. But SQL Server Profiler, if you're doing stuff and you just have SQL Server Profiler up, um, you can kind of see the queries going across the, the chain. And if you're using something like Entity Framework, sometimes those aren't efficient. So I think this is actually what William talked about last time a little bit. Um, but just just really just really seeing or, or realizing what's going to cause, you know, I'm actually hitting the database. I'm working over 100 records or 1,000 records, knowing that each one of those records or entities is going to hit, a, you know, be a database query. Um, that's something you don't see when your app is very small and it's just, you know, five people using it. But if you scale that out or you get large data sets that you weren't developing for when you were developing the code, uh, I've seen that happen too, where you just, you know, you have this little small data set. You're like, let me just see what the data looks like and kind of code against that. Then we get to production. There's just like, it's not five records you're trying to import. It's 10,000 records, right? <laughs> Time complexities get, get very important where you need to, you know, make sure things are optimized. And there's there's different tools out there to help you with that as well. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, another thing is thinking about your end user. So while you're developing this, you know, you're kind of doing what you think, um, what you think makes sense, but I often find that that's not really what your end user is gonna be doing, right? So it's really important to kind of think or ask about who's gonna be using this app, how they're gonna be doing it. Think about, you know, if they're gonna be wearing gloves, that's a big thing I kind of ran across, right? We we're talking about this industrial application or mobile app that we're trying to put out there for people, but they have these giant gloves on that, you know, <laughs> they're fat fingering everything. So you have to think about the size of, you know, the buttons and maybe we need a bigger tablet instead of, a, you know, an iPad mini or something like that. So really thinking about how your end user is gonna use this application what's going to make their lives easier. Um, it's not all about just writing the code that you're being told to write, you know, try to keep in mind who this is going to be for. Again, I, I feel like I've iterated this a couple of times, but don't reinvent the wheel. Someone's probably done what you're trying to do already, whether that's authentication, whether that's time zone, you know, issues, um, lots of things out there. There's, there's things that people have done already um, that have thought about it probably a lot more than you have when you're just sitting here trying to, you know, write it out. So, uh, see if there's packages out there that already do this. CSVs is a good one. I deal with CSVs every day in almost every project, imports, exports, that kind of thing. There's a tool called CSV Helper out there that just does everything beautifully already. Um, so that's a great example of one, I believe. The next thing, uh, I've kind of seen this a couple of times too. When you're developing a project, you import a package and then uh, sometimes the project dies or sometimes, you know, it, it kind of depends on if you're writing an application that's going to get shipped and be done with it, or you're trying to write a, uh, you know, an application or a product like Paystar that we have um, that's ongoing and, and continuously being developed, right? And it's not going to stop, essentially. Um, keeping those packages updated is, is crucial because they do have 
security fixes or bug fixes in those things, right? Um, I say in theory here though, because while you wanna keep those packages updated, if you're gonna do that, you also need to make sure everything still works, right? And even though, I, I guess just something I wanna make sure you guys know is, even though it compiles, it may not mean that it's actually going to work in when it's running to in runtime, right? Uh, there could be something that's changed that changes the way something behaves. So if you are updating your packages, make sure you're reading the release notes, uh, looking at the minor builds. If it's a major build that's been released, maybe wait or put a lot more effort into testing to make sure that's uh, something you wanna do. Learning keyboard shortcuts is important. Uh, it's, it's so interesting seeing different, you know, uh, different personality types. Some people are just on the keyboard moving around really fast and you have some that are, you know, moving around the mouse and just clicking on everything. Uh, so just keyboard shortcuts are really, really useful. Learn all of them that you can. Uh, practice often. So whether that's you going home after work and building something you wanna build, um, learning new technologies, I guess another bullet point, this could have been, you know, continue, always be learning, um, reading books, just learning about different things. Um, you can never learn everything in this field. Um, there's so much out there. So just practicing what you're doing, writing smaller applications uh, kind of helps you um, succeed and, and, and learn more over time. And the last thing I wanted to mention was uh, clean code. Um, if you're writing a project, and again, it's just something you're trying to bang out, get to a client, and that's gonna be it, sometimes moving fast is okay. Um, I find that's rare because generally people do want modifications to it and it becomes harder to to uh, to keep up with over time. But this is on here is clean code. There's also a book called Clean Code that I highly, highly recommend, um, but it talks about when to use comments um, or, or, you know, a thought on comments, I guess, because that's a very debated subject. Um, don't repeat yourself you know, all of these types of things, naming things, naming things is hard. Um, you know, I see a lot of people try to make very shorthand method names, for instance. Um, but you're, you're often reading your code when you're trying to figure something out, you're, you're reading it a lot more than you're actually writing the code. So if you have, you know, maybe it is a very long name where it's like, this is the method that calculates the blank. If you can't decide on the method name, that's like, you know, 20 characters long, being more verbose, verbose sometimes and just having exactly what it does when you're reading it, it kind of just makes sense instead of you trying to figure out what did this do again, right? So this book is great. Um, I think there's lots of things in there. I'm not gonna get into comments, I was going to, but uh, again, very debated, but I think this book explains it very well. It's a shorter book, um, but I think it gave me a lot of perspective on, on a lot of different things. Um, so I, I highly recommend that. Very quickly, some useful tools. Um, we have Ditto. Again, this is just a very, you know, put it out there list, but clipboard manager to, um, if you copy and paste a lot and you forgot, you know, you copied something since the last time you had, you know, you wanted something two or three copies back, Ditto kind of helps you out with that. Um, this is a big one. If you're writing C-sharp, link pads a must. Um, it lets you write very small programs without spinning up a whole solution or a project. You can quickly just say new file, type some C-sharp, click go gives you a result, dumps it out to kind of the console. Um, also connects to databases. So if you're doing data management, you can use C-sharp. It also has SQL built in. So you can kind of, um, you can quickly uh, just write small queries and, and test things out uh, using this tool. So it's a great tool. Uh, Whimsical is another one, um, lets you do those low fidelity um, wireframes or mockups or mind maps. Actually the mind map you saw at the beginning of this presentation was done in Whimsical. Highly recommend this. It's very easy to use uh, for kind of mapping out processes and, and uh, flows. Hangfire is another one. If you were at 411 the other day, um, the team that was working with me uh, implemented Hangfire. It's not so much the tool that's that's you know really use, useful. It's also thinking about what it's doing. It's scheduling jobs that happen um, you know once daily or every hour or even if you're trying to do back, you know, if you're doing things for a user that's submitting a file or something like that, and you don't need those results to be shown right away, instead of processing everything on demand, you can kind of offload that to a background thread and run that asynchronously using this tool. So great tool, very easy to use, uh, highly recommend it. Um, Serialog and log for net more of a logging, logging frameworks that are very easy to use, give you great, great outputs. 
Um, again, somebody's already created this. There's no need to create your own logging system. Postman, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with Insomnia. Um, another big thing is we're an Azure shop, so I'm sure AWS is the same thing, but there's just lots and lots of tools within these, these cloud platforms. Um, Logic Apps is one of the ones I've been using recently. Uh, Function Apps, they have event hubs, you know, storage, different types of storage. There's lots built into here, again, that if you're working for a company that can, that has budgets to use, instead of you going to develop all of these things by, from scratch, these systems already have like all of these tools built in to where you can move data around, um, you know, subscribe to different, when a, when a file is created, go do this thing. Kind of if, if this and that was the, the tool, um, which I'm not sure, I haven't used it in quite a while, but uh, it's kind of like an if this and that uh, system. So lots of stuff there. Uh, mentioned note of time in moment.js. Uh, moving right along, I realized, and I thought this would happen, it's uh, already 50 minutes in, so we try to speed it up a little bit. Uh, don't forget infrastructure. So learning DevOps, I think, is really important. I think, you know, there's lots of developers out there. One thing that's really hard to find is someone that knows how DevOps works, how those builds happen, and how, you know, you're deploying to these different machines or websites. Um, so I think that's a very useful skill, even if you're not going all the way to the server level and figuring all of that out, AD and everything, uh, even if you can learn kind of intermediary piece where it's doing builds to deploy to systems, I think that's a very crucial piece to learn as well. Um, one note kind of on logging. Um, I was a I was kind of very against logging everything all the time um, in custom applications we were building before. Um, I would just kind of log specific things that I needed. Um, and then I think I was convinced by Justin uh, one day, hey, let's put this log in here that logs every request that kind of comes in. It logs what comes in, what goes out. Um, and then kind of the next week, I believe, uh, something went wrong in one of the applications we're building. And instead of us going and diving down this whole, you know, rabbit hole of trying to figure it out, it was a very obscure thing. We looked at the logs that just had everything logged. Um, and that was super useful. We could just find it right away knew what the error was and can go fix it, right? Um, so I'm truly a believer in this now. Data is really cheap. Um, and storing that data, one, one thing to kind of think about is, yeah, it may cost something for us to store this data, but it's also probably a lot cheaper than us actually trying to figure out the problem manually, right? If you're going to take three hours to figure it out, we're talking about, you know, 300 plus dollars already. Um, so it's probably cheaper than to just actually log everything. Analytics is important. There's tons of tools out there that do this. Google Analytics, Mixpanel, um, Sentry IO is another one that kind of more uh, notifies you of errors. So lots of tools out there that kind of fit around your application that you've built that gives you insight into those. <clears throat> and just when you're when you're in doubt, try to capture all the data you can. So if you're writing something for MVP um, and you're getting data back and you don't know if you're going to need it or store it or whatever, try to store it somewhere. Um, because if you have all of this data for the MVP application you're building, what you have the flexibility to do now is perform a migration or put out a second version and use all that previous data you captured uh, and kind of, you know, migrate that to be part of your application now. So um, just a, a quick note there. A few non-technical points, because I believe these are really important too. Being technical and, and you know, all these tips I kind of just told you are more for development. Um, there's some quick tips I wanted to say on the non-technical side as well that I've just figured out over time. <clears throat> this is a big topic, so I'm going to try to not go deep into it. Um, but try to find wherever you end up working, try to be part of a learning organization. And what that means kind of in short is I I've seen some organizations that that kind of, they have the mentality of, oh, I'm a senior person. I know everything. You're an intern or a junior developer. You don't. So, you know, just go do your thing. Don't ask me. Like, that's my information. That's why I'm important. I'm going to do that, right? Um, those organizations, you know, those sometimes that turns into, oh, you're stupid or, hey, you're not worthy of this or whatever. Or I'm not telling you because I want my job security too, right? Um, and that just creates a very, <clears throat> a very toxic culture you know, where everybody's kind of fending for themselves and you know, you're not having great learning going on. So uh, I think you can Google learning organization, but essentially it's, it's this, this whole mindset of we're just gonna share as much knowledge as we can. 
no question stupid. If you have a question, ask it, you know, there's no judgment. Um, I, I think just having that, that, um, uh, psychological safety of, of having all of these people that feel like we can just talk about everything, have dev meetings, you know, um, and you're not going to be judged for it. That, that lets everybody get better. And if someone figures something out, let's also tell everyone about it. So now everyone can grow together too. Right. Um, great culture. That's what we strive for. Um, here at Elevator 3 and Paystar. Um, and I think it's really important. And I think everyone really, really loves being a part of it. So um, make sure that, I guess the bigger point was make sure you find an organization that that believes in that and isn't just, you know, you're not just a number. You're not just, hey, go do this and leave me alone. So I said that kind of already, but ask questions. Make sure you're always asking. <clears throat> You also kind of learn a lot by teaching too. You may think you know something, but when you start trying to teach it, um, or um, when you try to, to, to relay that information to someone, you kind of realize what gaps you have when they start asking questions to you, right? So, so that's a great thing. Um, I have, like I said, I've been doing this for 11 years. Justin's been doing it forever. There's a lot of people I know that have a lot of experience now. Everyone has imposter syndrome all the time. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's just feeling like you're not worthy or like you should know more than you, you know, you actually do. Um, there's just so much information out there and everyone's got something they're really good at or better at, right? It's, it's just a spectrum. So everyone feels like this at some point or another. Um, so just make sure you know that and kind of take that into consideration when you're trying to learn and asking questions and getting better. <clears throat> Uh, senior anything in my mind, senior developer, senior designer, whatever, just means you've Googled a lot more than that other person, right? Senior whatever in my mind means you just, you've encountered enough errors in your life that you know exactly what that error means now. <laughs> uh, make sure you push yourself. That's going to, you know, you're going to succeed in the long run if you just keep pushing yourself, keep always learning, reading, uh, that kind of stuff. Finding a mentor is another really important point. Make sure you have someone that's always you know, giving you new, fresh information, giving you their experience, try to latch on to someone, have someone to, to ask those questions, right? Um, kind of another point is watching what you say. And I guess this is just in a workplace, information spreads. I'll kind of just leave it at that. But whatever you say, just assume that everyone else is going to know it at some point. So just make sure you're aware of that. This one was actually something that I didn't do well at all, which was listening. Um, I could listen, but what would happen is, and this is kind of in a consulting context, someone gave me this feedback one time and it, it really, I've just kind of latched onto it, you know, since five or six years ago. When someone's kind of telling you their problem, don't just jump in and try to, you know, give them solutions right away. Let them kind of get all of their information out. Let them try to explain what's going on. And then what you can do is take what you heard and repeat it back to them and say, okay, so I'm hearing that you have this, you know, and this problem and that problem. So this is what I think we can kind of do, you know, going forward. Try not to interrupt people um, because they probably have something they want to get out. That's really important. That'll kind of change what you're thinking already. There's no need to kind of just jump in and, and, you know, cut them off. Um, so that's, that's very important, I believe. And then ask for feedback, right? I, I think this kind of goes along with the learning organization a little bit. Um, but just having this culture where everybody's kind of providing candid feedback to each other, um, again, it just lets everybody get better, right? Everyone's just just always learning about you know what what they can you know what they can improve on, and, and nobody's really judged for it. So great stuff. Um, build relationships. Networking is important, um, obviously in business. Business runs on relationships, so try to build them. Try not to burn bridges. If you're going to leave an organization and go somewhere else. There's no need to burn that bridge, right? I kind of believe the same thing with, with interns or, or people, anyone who works here really at Elevator 3, I don't want to burn any bridges. If you come and say, hey, I, I hope you already came to me and said, hey, I have a problem or here's what's going on or what could be better, right? But if you don't and you decide you want a job somewhere else, that, that's great. I'm happy for you. Like you obviously want to go be, you know, do this other thing. Let's keep in touch. Maybe it can be a mutual benefit, mutually beneficial relationship going forward, right? So um, relationships are super important. I don't believe there's ever a reason to really burn a bridge. Um, so, and then speak publicly. I know this is kind of, you know, I have a lot of stuff here. I probably could have, uh, filtered it down a little bit, but speaking publicly gives you that ability to 
to, you know, build those relationships more, to, to go out and, and build confidence uh, and give back. So go back to Southeastern when you graduate, you know, be a part of that and uh, try to help everyone grow because, you know, Baton Rouge, Hammond, New Orleans, it's a very small area. You kind of see the same names pop up all the time. So um, just again, building those relationships, giving back, it kind of helps everybody because now we all have a bigger pool that we can pull from and, and get better and, and grow this whole area, right? And then I kind of just had these books listed, kind of I already mentioned, Clean Code. There's one called Clean Coder, Clean Agile, Clean Architecture. These are my favorite books by Robert Martin. Um, so definitely check those out. They're kind of light reading, but give you great overviews of uh, development and kind of how to be a better professional, uh, agile workflows and, and how you should architect things. Five Dysfunctions of a Team is a great book that kind of talks about learning organizations um, in a roundabout way, but these are great fundamentals to build a team around. Radical Candor is all about, you know, giving candid feedback. I really, there's a YouTube video that kind of has a summary of this that's great. And then How to Win Friends and Influence People is just a great networking book. So um, I think that's about it. I'm gonna stop talking now, I'm at the hour mark. Um, I hope that was useful and you got something out of that. I am going to try to host these slides at the link that's on this slide right here. Um, I have not yet, but it should be up, you know, tonight or tomorrow. So if anybody has any questions, please let me know. I hope it was a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. So we want to open it up for questions. If anyone has um, questions, we have a couple minutes for that. 